So, game 12. Uh, in game 12, Fischer kicked off with c4. We have, uh, it looks like the English opening, but it actually transposes after e6. It's an invitation to go into potentially Queen's Gambit decline territory, and they go into Queen's Gambit decline territory here. Knight f6, knight c3, bishop e7. So a classic start position. Queen's Gambit declined. We have bishop g5. And black kicks the bishop. So the two main choices here in my book, it's either bishop h4 or to take on f6. And bishop h4 over time, the history of time is actually a little bit more popular than bishop takes f6. But both are very, very popular moves. Let's also, by the way, add a kibitza here. Okay, so the bishop drops back to h4. And Spassky Castles. So this is in game 12, 1972 match. Hi, all on stream. So, solid start position. White plays e3. Quite often, black is playing b6 to put the bishop here quite often. And all the choices are actually knight e4, kind of freeing maneuver. Looks like Capablanca's freeing maneuver. But knight bd7 was chosen here. Another popular choice. Rook c1. Uh, because black could gain a, a tempo on the bishop with taking potentially. White waits one more move. That's a useful waiting move in this position. Uh, if we look at this position, ah! If we look at this position from a live book perspective, rook c1 is actually the most popular move here. So queen c2, that's quite popular. Uh, so we have here rook c1. And now black plays c6. And we have bishop d3. Black took on c4. Bishop takes c4. Sorry, black took on c4, bishop takes c4. And now black gained the tempo with b5. So perhaps wanting to venture to the bishop later. We have bishop d3, a6. So you can imagine bishop b7 and c5. That's trying to sort out the one main issue in the position is the bishop here to sort out. And white makes the queen side a little bit more uncomfortable looking. Fisher plays a4, chipping away at this structure, encouraging it to move forward. Uh, so it's a small advantage here for white at this moment. And actually there's kind of an interesting decision here, uh, which is actually the main live book move. Engines don't seem to like it, while certain engine I'm using Fritz on this occasion doesn't actually like this move, even though it's like the main book move. Just fragmenting the pawns voluntarily with b takes a4 engines actually like to keep the pawns like with bishop b7 or c5 but b takes a4 so we have fragmented pawns and clearly uh, a targetable backward c pawn but the position is more complicated than that the white king is still in the center and black uses that fact to throw in this check and it forces a retreat because obviously this knight is a liability queen d2 we just take the knight so the knight has to go back uh if rook c3 then i believe there's well bishop b4 bishop b4 so yeah knight goes back and here black delays white castling again by the move bishop b4 so white cannot castle without losing d2 now so a slight inconvenience this knight drops back unpinning and here is where black tries to activate potentially this bishop and the rooks c5 typical liberating move so spassky is playing energetically here with the black pieces trying to solve certain problems in the position we have knight b3 gaining a tempo on the queen. Queen drops back. White castles. 
c takes d4 fisher refuses an isolated queen's pawn he plays knight takes d4 bishop b7 so at the moment black hasn't got any problem pieces his pieces seem quite nice his structural defects well the main one is seems to be a6 other than that the pawn structure here for black looks fairly solid an interesting move here now to challenge the bishop on b7 fisher plays bishop e4 making use of that pin at the moment to just challenge that bishop Spassky just protects it with queen b8 of course this is subject to some harassment with bishop g3 and that is actually made use of bishop g3 but the queen has got a7 and now knight c6 is played so hitting the queen and the bishop can this be tolerated well actually on queen b6 this is a big problem here because of knight a4 this position is a big problem knight d4 and how is the queen protecting b7 so black really has to take it seems on c6 we have bishop takes c6 so white's gained the bishop pair and you look like quite decent bishops in this position is it a small positional advantage rook ac8 black's pieces are quite active we have knight a4 protecting the bishop like that rook fd8 and now there's threats include knight c5 to hitting the queen so the queen uh, attack is parried here by bishop f3 in advance so the bishops look quite nice on the diagonals together there okay spasky plays a5 and now we have rook c6 if white can double that will be quite dangerous for black queen c1 will be dangerous pressure black will not be able to play easily rook c8 so black actually snaps that rook off and then challenges that c file immediately with rook c8 no the advantage here actually uh question on stream is it a big positional advantage more like well or comment it, actually the engine's not really greatly enamored with white's position here it's giving it as just a small edge 0 0.20 in fritz terms it's just a small advantage it considers here i think black's position is is fairly compact there's no major structural weakness black's bishop on b oh oh there hang on let me put scroll lock bother me i'm trying to put a scroll lock so rook takes c6 bishop takes we have rook c8 bishop f3 black's position is is uh fairly compact um we have now a move which does does seem actually quite accurate here what is white actually threatening though what has white got any threats on the horizon in this position i'm not entirely sure maybe getting the queen up and trying to just have default pressure but we see actually queen d3 as a move being stopped with this next move queen a6 sniffing out on that diagonal d3 so we have actually h3 and the queen persists on that diagonal here on move 28 we see queen b5 yeah it's given as about equal here what can white do with the bishop pair you need really targets exploitable targets sometimes for these things to be um more meaningful although white's got the bishop pair, where are the exploitable targets in black's position uh so we see okay bishop e2 and the queen goes to c6 now and in this position maybe black has on the cards knight e4 if white's not careful uh just to get a knight to e4 and even if it's pinned then to reinforce it with the other knight so white perhaps is a bit wary of that bishop f3 is played here 
94 is impossible here because we can just snap that off and then take on d7 so Fisher is stopping this 94 business Queen b5 so both sides are seemingly quite stubborn we have b3 now being played it does provide a square potentially for the bishop if it wants to go to c4 later a protected square it does weaken the dark squares a bit bishop e7 and we do have bishop e2 queen b4 now bishop a6 a forcing move what is it actually doing rook c6 bishop d3 it seems a probing game at the moment knight c5 so what to do about b3 should white take on c5 taking on c5 would actually kind of relieve black a bit more it seems with black having technically a small advantage from an engine perspective this is uncomfortable pressure here and if black gets in knight d5 maybe knight c3 later this could get quite nasty for white quite quickly you can imagine also the bishop coming to this diagonal so white has to be careful after this knight c5 not to let black untangle too quickly we see another forcing move queen f3 looking at the rook the rook drops back and now knight takes c5 here is played and we've got to watch out for this a8 square i believe in some variations uh, if if rook takes c5 rook then queen a8 check is actually fairly dangerous here bishop f8 bishop d6 white's winning all of a sudden so black has to be careful how he recaptures here uh taking with the queen would seem okay or the bishop the bishop is chosen for the recapture <clears throat> uh, we have rook c1 so it looks as though there's potential for a little bit of torture for black in this position it, it seems as though there's pressure right why has the bishop pair black gets out of this pin in a hurry with rook d8 doesn't want that pin and now that square that's that b3 square is used uh you might wonder hold on a sec was there, was there anything tactical like this to hit the bishop actually um no white has a strong move here in this position if queen takes b3 it's played here can i test any of you awake in this variation white to play here and win this is just a variation what could white play in this position uh so this is a variation of the game if queen takes b3 had been played instead of rook d8 what has white got at his disposal so anyone awake on stream i'll give you 20 seconds to see there's a crushing move in this position this is just a variation any ideas uh, some many some of you well a couple of you on play chess uh, ha, might have the right idea you might have the right idea yes yes someone stream um okay yeah there's a forcing move which is you always have to look at the forcing moves as a general generalization in chess the forcing moves no matter how outrageous you've got to investigate what tactical impact they have and here rook takes c5 remember that queen's in touch with a8 here in this position which is a significant fact now after this check 
because the escape exit is cut off here. So that's winning. It's, it's mate coming up there. Uh, so, yeah, we have the cautious rook d8, not allowing that sort of stuff. Bishop c4. It still seems fairly comfortable with the bishop pair. You might think, is this a chance of undermining? I'm not sure this does anything, this kind of undermining. I think it might be a, a, a reasonable move, though, in the position. It's actually actually one of the top engine choices just to dissolve the pawn. But the pawn is actually quite useful for holding b4. Black actually plays queen d2. He doesn't mind about his a pawn. Queen d2, which seizes control for a moment of that d file, of course. And the rook goes passive to f1. We have the rook going to f1. <laughs> it seems a kind of meek move to play, but... Um, why not? White's, White's got that light square bishop here. If he can keep his pieces on light squares away from black's bishop, this kind of move often makes sense. It's pretty safe there. It's protected by the king, at least. It avoids back row check tactics. So yes, it seems like a passive move. It's not a draw offer. The game continues after this. Uh, and with this, White could start having threats. Well, like bishop c7 exists as a threat in this position. So the a pawn um, is actually protected with bishop b4. On move 40 now we have bishop c7, the rook moves, and it goes there and it looks as though this infiltration might be something for concern. Queen c6 is white fresh thing anything in particular not entirely sure the bishops look good I mean they've got coverage of a lot of squares uh, between them I don't think there's any tactical threats or anything not with this passive rook not yet there's no there's no major issue to worry about we have Queen c2 and with this there might be the possibility of rook d2 to put some pressure on f2 uh, we have bishop e5, threatening bishop takes and queen takes rook. Rook does go to d2. Is the structural damage worth it? Well, Fisher actually played a check first and then actually did take on f6. So we have a more simplified scenario, opposite colored bishops, which can favor the attacking player or the power of the initiative but uh, here whites and black both seem solid enough we have queen f3 okay it's looking at taking on f6 but it's basically just plays f5 here so can whites create some major initiative on the light squares Fisher plays on, yeah, he, he's trying to with his next move, quite aggressive on the light squares. G4, try and break this pawn chain up. It's basically just offers an exchange of queens though, and making use of that weakened f3 queen, no longer protected. So queen e4 with tempo, king g2. And here, the Black King simply moves to g6, believe it or not. This could be helpful in the variations, I believe. Say takes, we can take, take, we can then take with the King, avoiding any structural issue there. So the King coming out a little bit early looking in the position but why not it helps maintain the pawn structure we have rook c1 is there any threats in the position not too many bishop a3 here bishop b4 rook c1 
Bishop drops back to e7. And now actually g takes f5 is played. e takes. White e takes. Well, hold on a sec. White e takes, because it isn't that damaging the structure. Queen takes f5. There's nothing really to worry about with this either, it seems. There's no major issue with, with that move. But yeah, e takes f5 was played. Here, interestingly, um, well, that's a relative term. If rook g1, is, is white actually threatening anything with rook g1? It doesn't seem a big deal, to be honest. It doesn't seem a big deal. We just have rook e1 in this position. But this rook e1 is on a dark square and we have the bishop on a dark square and actually this is the basis of a neat tactic by black which definitely more than equalizes well it's an equal position definitely equalizes the position 100% can you see what Boris Pasky plays in this position so black to play I don't know how many of you know this game game 12 of the 1972 match black to play here what did black play in this position Any ideas? I'm giving you 20 seconds at least. I think there's a stream delay. So, uh, black to play. Okay, yeah. We have another seemingly outrageous forcing move, but it really simplifies the position. I think it's the best one to play. Rook takes f2, believe it or not. Forcing move because bishop h4 check. So we're skewing the king and the rook. So then we can take on f3 and then take on e1. And here the agreed a draw uh, even though blacks won a pawn remember blacks got double pawns which aren't as significant and it's obviously opposite color bishops so it is a fairly peaceful position now so they agreed a draw here now yes Okay, one of the duller games in the match, you know, not the most exciting, but don't worry, uh, we're coming up to a decisive game on, on the next game we look at, um, maybe next week, which is, is quite exciting, actually, I can tell you that, uh, and dramatic, but uh, so this is the calm, versus, calm before the storm, this game 12, um, yeah. So game 13 was decisive. Then there were a few draws actually, three, four, five, six, seven draws. And then actually there were a few more decisive games. So the match did become quite lively um, later. Uh, we're just at a calm point here at game 12. So I know it's um, not, not the most exciting, the interesting thing about this game, how many times did Fisher play, you know, the white side of a Queen's Gambit declined? Uh, so it's maybe it's it's a very unusual thing. Uh, Fisher's kind of bypassed perhaps a lot of preparation 
in his in his one e4 by playing the queen's gambit declined he's bypassing a lot of preparation so he's he's made it um, uh, he's given himself a much more practical advantage have you got any questions anyone got any questions about this game um i know it's not the most exciting game i've ever covered ever um Okay, I'll take any questions about it. Otherwise, I'll see you uh, next week. But have some question time. Question time. Can I go back to when Black played Rook takes C6? To see if Knight E5 was possible. Question on stream. Okay. Okay, there's one question I'll just address here. Rook takes c6. Now, knight e5 is not possible, right? I think we just take here, right? It was, it was pinned to d8. I'm not sure what position you mean to be honest. Have you got a move number? <clears throat> okay, there's a question on play chess next. Um question. So Comstra. Comstra? What's your question, Comstra? Bypass preparation? Yeah, but it's 1972, and I think, you know, we've got loads and loads of top Russian players thinking maybe Fischer's going to play 1e4 in this World Championship match. He, he rarely played the Queen's pawn throughout his entire career. It was very rare. So he, he he's playing in this match multiple times now, all of a sudden. Queen's Gambits. Queen Gambits. The Queen's Gambit. So they would have tried to thoroughly prepare and dossiers and actually I have a book, uh, The Russians versus Fisher, given to me by my good friend Costas Karyanis. And it says I think there were you know reports, you know, what the strengths and weaknesses of Fisher, these reports of strengths and weaknesses and stuff. I think Korshnoy might have predicted a chain that Fisher might have played you know, playing E four. But it's a lot of work to Try and prepare an advance. Sorry, d4. It's a lot of work to anticipate Fisher playing d4. What did Fisher win overall in this World Chess Championship? A lot of money. He Fisher kind of commercialized the World Chess Championships. Bef before that, uh, you could argue, or some sources regard, you know, the World Championships before the 1972 match. Were essentially kind of internal affairs you know ussr internal matches uh, fisher elevated the commercial status of in, in my view from what i gather you know the world chess championships you know to give huge prize funds which didn't previously exist so he made it way uh, made way for you know the professional chess player in the commas where you can actually earn a decent living of course he created a massive huge wave of interest in the game as well but uh, by being picky about the prize fund he he, he made it more um, commercially viable for many people to take the game more seriously you could argue now the details of the 1972 match you can actually find uh, details one of my favorite sites is chess gamescom if you want to read a little bit about the of course you could use wiki as well but here's a reference i'll give on stream uh to the 1972 match have a look at that reference called like the match of the century match of the century so this was game 12 you'll see it's it's the calm before the storm if you look at game 12 then we got the decisive game then we got a few draws i'm not sure how we handle them but then a f there's a few decisive games after that
okay so I know I know I haven't been mega exciting and I didn't even plot this in advance this um, stream I'm sorry about that I will give more notice on YouTube uh, particularly uh, next week for whatever I'm covering um yeah sometimes games are just like this players keep things in balance there isn't if there isn't any major you know problem move or mistake then the game is kept roughly in balance but you know to a tolerance to a threshold which means that you know draw is kind of generally agreed so um yeah I, I i thought you know to try and be a bit systematic about the games uh, just in case they have interest points uh, obviously there were points in this game where black had to be careful about underlying tactics you know like when the queen was an f3 he had to be careful about the forcing move tactics not to have some queen a8 disaster so if there's some lessons to be learned you know even in the draws you know both sides actually very careful behind the scenes um the the you know black accepted in this pawn fragmented pawns which is actually theory uh he had created via that uh, sufficient peace play in the position he didn't mind why having the bishop pair uh, as long as sometimes there's there's few exploitable targets doesn't it's not really a, a major big deal and then black got some peace activity on the dark squares and it culminated actually a combination to simplify further later to fully kind of equalize okay so uh maybe uh we'll see, see you next week until the 15th uh the radio shows go so another two before christmas so next week and the week after okay thanks thanks for coming and i'll i'll put it more in advance next time on youtube and it should be an exciting much more exciting game next week if we do carry on with this match next week i assure you okay thanks very much uh see you next week about the same time five past nine usually about five past nine okay thanks for coming see you next week comments or questions on youtube oh remember to like the video if you're on youtube that's much appreciated thanks very much